This is a video about the difference between gravitational and electrical fields. Well, welcome back to the wonderful world of gravity. But guess what? You already live there. To experience a gravitational force in this universe that we're calling gravity, an object must have what physical property? Well, that's mass. In this gravitational universe, an object with mass can modify or warp space. So notice in this picture here that what's happening is that the space around the Earth is being warped um, just because the Earth is very massive. So the fact that the Earth has a, large, a lot of mass warps the space around it. And so the moon gets trapped in what we call its gravitational well. Notice that the force vector displays the direction and magnitude of the gravitational force, always inward towards the center in this case. Notice how the space around the Earth changes so that the moon gets trapped in what we call this gravitational potential well. All right, now, if we can consider this like a two-dimensional side view, let's look at how larger masses modify space. So in other words, how a large mass like the Earth modifies space as opposed to a smaller mass like an asteroid. So if we look at the forces due to gravity, they notice that they increase as we get closer to the, to the actual masses, okay, in, in what we call these gravitational wells. However, a larger mass has a larger gravitational potential well, and also larger force vectors, relatively speaking. So from what I'm calling this two-dimensional top view, you can notice that the force due to gravity on the Earth is larger at the surface of the Earth as opposed to the surface of that asteroid. And relatively speaking, the forces due to gravity on the Earth are larger than the forces due to gravity on the asteroid. Now let's look at these very small masses, something really small, maybe like on the order of the size of a person relative to the Earth and relative to the asteroids. We would consider these masses, these little red dots here, to be very small relative to the Earth and to the asteroid. So small that its own gravity is negligible, but it experiences a gravitational force toward the larger masses, towards the Earth and towards the asteroid. Another way of, of thinking about it is like this. The mass is so small, but large enough that it can be attracted to other masses, but it cannot itself attract other masses to it. That's one way of thinking about it. Uh, now, what are gravitational field lines? Okay, gravitational field lines represent the direction that a small mass would experience a force. So let's look at these gravitational field lines and draw them in your notes. So for the asteroid, the gravitational field lines look like that. They point towards the center of the asteroid. In other words, that's the direction that the small mass, this small mass would experience a force. Similarly, the Earth would also attract a small mass. So these lines of force show the direction that the small masses would go if they were placed at those particular locations. They would point towards the center of the larger masses. Okay, so now notice, however, that these gravitational field lines could still be drawn even if we don't show the smaller mass. So even if we don't have a mass out here, if we don't include it, we can still draw the gravitational field lines. Okay, um, so notice that the gravitational field lines can be drawn even when other masses are not nearby. The reason is that they show where the masses would go if they were nearby. All right, so we remember that the universal gravitational force equation looks like that, okay, where the force due to gravity is equal to the constant, big G, 
and we multiply it times a, the two masses and divide it by the distance between the masses. So the gravitational field at a particular point in space is the amount of gravitational force per kilogram. So if we take that force due to gravity, this equation here, and divide it by the mass, the small mass, we actually cancel out this m in the equation because we're dividing it by the small mass, and we end up with this um, combination of constants. This large G, that's a, a universal gravitational constant, that would be the mass, in this case, of the Earth, and this R would be the radius of the Earth. So in that case, because all three of these are constants, they create another constant, which is actually our acceleration due to gravity, which we notice is the acceleration due to gravity near the surface of the Earth. So this is the gravitational field near the surface of the Earth. Further from the center of the Earth, the gravitational field decreases. All right, so the gravitational field near the surface of the Earth is this value. So we can actually think of G as the gravitational field near the center of the Earth. So this quantity here is how we can actually define the gravitational field. All right, now, now we've looked at the... Uh, or since we've looked at the gravitational world, let's move over to the electrical world, okay? So to experience an electrical force in the electrical universe, an object must have what physical property? Well, in this case, it must have charge. In the electrical universe, an object with charge can modify or warp space. So how do larger charges modify space? They have larger electrical potential wells, just like in the gravitational world, and they have larger force vectors, just like in the gravitational world. So here are our force vectors. Notice we label them with electrical force. And notice that relatively speaking, the forces for the larger charge are larger than the forces for the smaller charge, and that makes sense. So um, we consider these large charges to be what we call point charges. They're large enough that other charges experience a force when they are nearby. Now, we call these other charges test charges, or very small charges, similar to the person in our previous example. They're so small that its own electrical force is negligible, but large enough that it experiences an electrical force towards the point charges. So notice they're being pulled in towards the two point charges. So think of it this way. The charge is so small that it can be attracted to other charges, but it, it itself cannot attract other charges. That's one way of thinking about it. Okay, now, what are electric field lines? Well, electric field lines represent the direction in which a small positive test charge experiences a force. Okay, so the... Let's, let's draw these electrical field lines for this very large charge. Notice that the electrical field lines point toward the center of these negative charges. Okay, so these are positive test charges. So they would be attracted to this large negative and the smaller but still large negative charge. Okay. Um, in the electric world, there's what we call chargism. In other words, a preference for the positive charge. Everything is based on the positive charge. Okay, now, these um, electric field lines, notice that the electric field lines can still be drawn even when other charges are not nearby. The reason is that they show where a positive test charge would go if they were nearby. So. If there was a positive test charge here, 
it would move in this direction. But even if we ignore this positive test charge, these lines of force, our field lines, would still exist, or at least they would still be represented. All right, now, remember Coulomb's law. This is Coulomb's law. It's similar to the universal gravitational force law, but for electrical charges, the electric field, okay, let's define this. The electric field at a particular point in space is the amount of electrical force, electrical force per coulomb. In the gravitational world, it was the amount of gravitational force per, mat, per kilogram, but in this case, it's per coulomb because we're in the electric world. Okay, so let's take this equation and divide it by the, um, the test charge, just like with the gravitational force equation, we divided it by the, by the smaller mass. Here we're dividing it by the smaller charge or the test charge. So what happens is, notice that we have the test charge in the numerator. We're dividing by the test charge in the denominator. So that cancels out that um, test charge in the numerator. So we end up with this quantity here. So by definition, our electrical field is amount of electrical force per unit charge. Or for point charges, we could use this equation. So both of these equations are legitimate equations to find the electric field. And the units for the electric field are newtons per coulomb, just like we defined there. Okay, so what if a point charge is positive? So notice that now our lines of force move away from the um, large positive point charge, okay? So a summary of electric fields. The electric field is a vector. It has both magnitude and direction. Further from the point charge, electric field decreases, and the electric field is always based on the positive charge. Now, let's look at this particular problem. We've got this proton out here and this very large positive test charge. It's two microcoulombs. That's really large compared to the charge of a proton. We're saying that it's four meters away. The proton is four meters away from the uh, point charge. Um, we want to know what the electric field is at the proton's location. So first, what we can do is we can solve for the force on the proton using Coulomb's law. So this is Kq, that's the charge of the proton, what we're going to call our test charge, and our other charge, our larger charge there, which is the um, two micro coulomb charge, that's going to be our point charge. I'm sorry, our, yes, our point charge, and this is going to be our test charge. Sorry, I misspoke. This is our test charge, and this is our point charge. And R is the distance between them. So if we solve for that force, we take this constant, which is K, multiply it times the value of our two charges, and divide by the distance between them squared, and we find that we get 1.8 times 10 to the minus 16th newtons. Okay, so that tells us the force between them. Now, since the electrical field is amount of force per unit charge, and in this case, notice that we are using the test charge, in this case, the proton's charge. We take the value that we got there, divide it by the charge of the proton, and we get an electric field strength of 1,130 newtons per coulomb. Now, there's another way of solving for this. Another way of solving for this is um, by taking our equation, our two equations, and combining them together. Notice that I can take that equation and, and plug it directly into that equation. If I do that, I get this equation, which we, uh, which we showed earlier, and we, all we do there is take the electric 
I'm sorry, the, um, this um, constant, multiply it by our point charge, okay, always the point charge, and divide it by the distance between the point charge and the point charge and the test charge. Notice, okay, so that, yeah, what I'm trying to point out there is that's the value of the point charge. Notice that all you need is the value of the point charge and the distance away, uh, away from it to determine the electric field. Notice that we didn't even mention what the charge is out there. So this is the value of the electric field at this location right there. Okay, even though we don't have the test charge out there, we can still determine the value of its of the electric field from the point charge.